we welcome those who are watching by video, not just those who are here. Psalm 147. It starts off by saying, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Well, this should be the heart of every believer, that we should be happy, we should be joyful, even though things are going on around us. When we come before God, we come before our Creator, knowing that He has all the resources and everything is at His disposal, everything in his, is in His hands, and we can then give every problem, trouble or trial over to Him and allow Him to take the strain. And we praise Him because He's our Creator. We praise Him because He's our Father in Heaven. He's a living God. He's not a dead God. He's not stone or wood. He's a living God. And because of that, He deserves our praise because He's our Creator God. He is above all gods on this earth. He is the only true and living God. So that's really important that we praise God, that we have thanksgiving to God and we exalt his name. Hmm. Jesus started off with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. So there is a praise, there is a, a set of uh, understandings that, that suggest that God is almighty, that he is all-powerful, that he deserves our respect, that we should fear God, because fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So there is a sense in which we should fear and respect him, not in the fearful way that we are cowering down before him because we are his children, but in the sense that there must be real respect and praise for, for the God. He's a jealous God. He's jealous of all other gods, all other idols, that may come into our lives, we have to get rid of because he's a jealous God and he wants us to praise him. He created us to praise him. He didn't create us to praise and idolize other things, whether it be people or things. And so because of his jealous nature that he created us for himself, that he gets you know, upset with us if we are not praising him, if we are not putting him first in our lives, if we're not acknowledging who he is, very, very important. It says in verse 2, The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Okay, so this is his message to you today. We are the new Jerusalem. We are engrafted branches to that holy line. And so therefore, we know that he builds us up. He builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts. Anyone an outcast here? Yeah, all you outcasts, <laughs> God gathers us all together. <laughs> you know, somebody said, oh, they're not going to church, they're all hypocrites in church. Well, that's okay, there's always room for one more. It's okay, just come along, you know, because we're all hypocrites at the end of the day, and we're all sinners saved purely by God's grace. So that's okay. And so he gathers us together. You know, we're all a, a bunch of misfits when you think about it. Every one of us have got issues and problems. We see enough of it in psychotherapy to you know, to launch a battleship. Yeah, you know, it's so much that people have, and and we come together in relationships, hoping that we're going to be compatible, make it work. And of course, we're not compatible at all. We're all full of issues and problems, and we have to work out how to love one another in Christ, how to uh, work out relationships in Christ. And so God brings these outcasts together as he did with Israel, he's doing with us today, and he heals the brokenhearted. If there's anyone that's been brokenhearted here, anyone's going through brokenhearted issues, any relationship problems, then God calls the brokenhearted together and he heals them. You know, there is healing in Christ, and so we know that, and we need to come to God. So when people say, well, oh, I felt so bad today, I, I didn't go to church, it, it's a nonsense, really, because this is where you come to when you're brokenhearted. This is where you come to when you're feeling low. This is where you come to when you're feeling sick and you need to be healed. You come to church. If you're dying, you need to come to church. If you're dead, someone needs to bring you to church to be resurrected. You know, this is where we should come to. Not feel sad and lonely and old and upset and, you know, problems and, oh, I can't come to church, you know, I've got this problem today. Well, sorry, but that is not the right attitude of a believer. An attitude of a believer is, 
I'm going to be there because I want to feel God's presence and be in God's presence with the other believers that he gathers together in his name as the body of Christ. Very, very important we understand this. This idea of not coming to church um, it, it's really, it's not, it's not godly. It, it's not coming from God. It's coming from minds that are manipulated by things around us. So be aware of that, please. It's really important. It says in verse 4, He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is, a, is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. So he understands everything that's going on in your life. So you might think, oh, well, <clears throat> you know, I've got, I've got so many complications. You know, I can't be uh, in the body of Christ. I can't serve Christ. I can't do this. I can't do that. But God knows everything. God knows all about you. He knows all about your problems. What he's waiting for is for you to come to him with them and not just try to carry them yourself or do things in your own strength. <coughs> you know, to sit at home and mope and moan because things are going wrong in your life. It's not right. It's not godly. You know, we are to bring everything to God. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So this is what we need to re remember, really. He calls us by name. He calls all the stars by name. He created everything. He knows everything. And it says here, the Lord lifts up the humble and he casts the wicked down to the ground. So if you're humble before God, if you really come to God in all humility, recognizing who he is, trusting in his power, trusting in the fact that he loves you, He's going to lift you up. And those people that are causing you problems, you need to bring them before God. You need to ask God to save them, not to destroy them. <laughs> you need to ask God to save them. You need to forgive them and ask God to save them. And anyone who is in a wicked place, if they get saved, they're no longer in a wicked place. This was the problem with Jonah. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because they were terrible people. They were sacrificing babies to Molech and all sorts of things. And I've heard on the dark web, web now there are things going on where women are sacrificing their babies. And there are all sorts of things happening in this world that we're, we're not always aware of because we live in this, we live with the nice people. <laughs> we live with the nice people and we, we don't venture into those dark areas which is good, you don't really need to but at the same time it's, a, it's being aware that there are these things going on very important I heard of one woman, uh, one couple who had, um, had nine babies and sacrificed them all and had them cropped and sent off somewhere else um, <coughs> and sold them for about £1,500 each to be cropped I mean, these are the things that go on in the world. These things happen. And so verse 7 says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God. So we should be singing praises to God. While we, <coughs> while we ask and pray for people to be saved, while we ask God to save people um, and, and, and evangelize people and let them know about the love of God, because that's what people are missing, you know, to get them out of wickedness. And so we need to be praising God for our lives and, and giving thanks for what we do have and the things that are going on. The fact that we're still breathing, the fact that we're still living. You know, we need to give thanks for that. We need to give thanks for all the good things that he's done for us in our lives. And that's really important. And um, it says, Who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth. He's certainly been preparing rain for the earth this week, isn't he? Anyway, who makes grass to grow on the mountains, he gives to the beasts its food and to the young ravens that cry. So he's sufficient for everything. He actually produces everything that we need in this world and even for our, the animals, even for nature itself, it's all held together by God. It's all held together by Christ in God. And that's important. When we read John, you can see that everything holds together in him. Verse 10 says, He does not delight in the strength of the horse and he takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. So it's no good us thinking about all the things that we've got and all, all the things that we have to help strengthen us. So it, 
nowadays it would be it would be money and and houses and and things in those days it was how many horses you had and how many chariots you had you know to fight against your enemies the strength of how many horses you had that's what made you a powerful king or a powerful nation a powerful army and that's what they had or taking no pleasure in the legs of a man you know warriors people who are very strong people who are hardened strengthened warriors that had you know exercised all their lives and and lived by the sword lived by um you know being part of the army and maybe uh, at the same time there were farmers and you know there were shepherds and things like that and, and they were hardy people some of them were nomadic and they were hardy people so certainly in the days of abraham there were nomadic and and in moses time you know wandering in the wilderness there were there were nomads and they were very hardy people. These were these were hard people to to be around. You know, they were very very strong. But God says He didn't take pleasure in that. He takes He takes no pleasure in in the fact that you know you may have strength in this world, or or even someone who is charismatic and who has strength seems to have strength in himself. God takes no pleasure in that. It doesn't. It doesn't impress him that you're a fighter it doesn't impress him that you're a strong person in your own right that doesn't impress God God's no respecter of persons he's not interested in what you've got in your resources and he's no not interested in you and how strong you are in the way you are he's not he doesn't take any pleasure in that so we can we can find ourselves going to 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 get the admiration of people and trying to strengthen ourselves in many ways. But God, God doesn't care about that. He's not interested in, in that kind of way of being. Okay? He says, the Lord takes, verse 11 says, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. So that's the, that's the, the upshot. He, he takes pleasure in you if you if you live in the fear of God and you understand God and you obey God that's that's the whole point that you are subservient to God that you recognize who God is and who you are that you are a mere creature of God at the end of the day but in that sense also being brought adopted into his family to be game, become great in his kingdom as a son or daughter in the kingdom so but in your natural sense, in your sinful state, in all the things that you've accumulated in this world, and all the strength that you feel that you've got, and maybe the strength of character, maybe the intelligence, maybe the learning, maybe the status, maybe the money you've put by, none of these things, he's not interested, he doesn't take any pleasure in that. He's only interested in you if you recognize him and glorify him and rely on him for all that you have and all that you do and all the resources at your disposal he's only interested if you fear him and accept that he is the one who gives you strength does that make sense amen <coughs> verse 12 says praise the lord o jerusalem praise your god o zion for he has strengthened the bars of your gates he has blessed your children within you he makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest wheat so this is this is a picture of god supplying everything we need in other words, if you put big strong things on your gates, if you, if you get a really strong front door in the houses that we have today, you put a really strong front door on that, on that house, if someone really wants to get in, they're going to get in. They're going to find a way. You know, it makes you laugh, doesn't it? Because we have these sheds in our garden that are made of kind of wood, and maybe a little bit of thin tin that we have in the garden, and we put these big padlocks on the lock on this shed, and yet the padlock's n not what's going to give. It's it's actually the material behind it. You know, a crowbar or a big screwdriver, and it's gone. It's a waste of time putting this big big padlock on it because it doesn't deter anybody or anything. But this is how we think that we 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 can strengthen things. We can make things strong. 
But, you know, there's always, it's like contracts, it's the same. You make agreements, guess what? Contracts are always broken. That's why the law courts are full of it. You can make a contract, <coughs> and you can even go to court and get a court order, but people can ignore it and, and break it anyway. And sometimes it's very difficult to get that resolved. And so if we're relying on ourselves, if we're relying on all the things that are going on in this world to keep us safe, <coughs> we've lost it somehow. We haven't really understood. There's only one person that can strengthen the bars of our gates, and that is God himself. God can strengthen the bars. That's what it says here. For he has strengthened the bars of your gates. In other words, he's going to keep you secure. He's going to keep you protected. <coughs> there may be things that go on in this world that we have to go through, trials and problems, but God is the one who's going to bring you through. You read Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. This is God. This is what God wants us to understand, that we have to rely and trust in God. He's the living God. He's our Father God. He doesn't want anything to happen to his children unless we go astray. And then, obviously, what we are shown in the Scriptures, if when we totally go astray, when we are totally disobedient and we ignore him and we try to uh, strengthen the bars of our gates ourselves and we try to make ourselves, our lives work, then he will show us that that doesn't work. He will allow us to go on in our foolishness. And he will allow us to make mistakes and go our own way when we're disobedient. He's a gentleman. He doesn't, he's, he doesn't treat us like robots. You know, when you go the wrong way, he will pull you back. In the same way that Jonah didn't want to do what he said, and he went off in the other direction. But what happened? He just brought him back. He just brought him back to where God wanted him to be. So we can't frustrate the purposes of God. We can't just continue to, to go against God. You may be a believer and you've given God the glory, but at the same time you're just going against God. You're, you're not really taking any notice. When we read the scriptures, you pick the things out of it that you want and you don't take any notice of the things that you don't like to hear or doesn't go with your character or doesn't go with your paradigm of how life should be it doesn't go with your charism it doesn't go with who you are as a person it doesn't go with your culture it doesn't go with your fashion it doesn't go with your thought mind you know and so he lets you go he lets you do it he'll even let you backslide He'll call you back. He's given you the Holy Spirit to prompt you, to convict you. But he still gives you the will, as a believer, to do good or bad. And it's up to you. But he will bring you back. And he will actually chastise you to bring you back if necessary, which is what he did with Israel in many, many times. He allowed other nations to come in and take them all off into captivity and many of them died. And so God in his infinite wisdom has created us as people to praise him and to come to him and he wants us, he wants our worship, he wants us to worship him as our creator God. That's very, very important. And then we will have a blessing for our children he makes peace in your borders. He helps you to be a peacemaker too. That's his message. His message is peace, really. If people obey God, it's peace. If people go against God, like you saw all the people in the Old Testament there, when they went against God, when they were serving evil, when they were you know, sacrificing babies in the fire to Molech, when they were doing all kinds of evil practices, what happened to them? What's happened to all the empires that have gone off from being you know, quite solid in many ways and started to go off into all manner of perversions and problems? What has God done? They have not survived. They have all been destroyed. 
and he used God's people in those days to come against them. So that was an, an important thing. But he also allowed some of these nations to overcome Israel at times when they had just become so proud and arrogant and stiff-necked and just went their own way and just ignored the God who had formed them and created them into a nation and called them by his name. And so he just literally allowed them to go their own way and let other armies come in and decimate them. But he always kept a remnant for himself. One thing we do know, if we look through the Old Testament, God always keeps a remnant. There's a certain people that he keeps for himself. And we know about what happens in the church today. We have the sheep and the goats and we have the the virgins that have the oil and the virgins that don't. We have the wheat and the chaff. He keeps a remnant for himself. We have to make sure that we're in that remnant. We need to make sure that we are honouring God and praising God and, and worshipping God and trusting in God for everything. That's the important things. <coughs> and then he'll make you a peacemaker. And it says, and fills you with the finest wheat. In other words, it's a picture of plenty. He's going to give you plenty. You, you're going to get your heart's desires when you're in Christ, when you're in God, when you're trusting in God for your salvation, you're also trusting God for your life. It's not just trusting God to be saved and then go, oh, that's it, All right, I'm saved now, I can just relax, I'll just do what I want now. I won't bother to even you know, serve God in any way, I'll just sit there and be a passenger and just, I'll just you know, let it all kind of go on and I'll just carry on with my life because I'm saved. No, that's not good enough. That's not what God's calling you to. Verse 15, he says, he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out his hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. So in the same way that he can bring such a cold wind and, and bring you know, such incredible cold to this planet he also melts it as well he also blows his wind on the planet and you know he causes the waters to flow again he declares his word to Jacob his statutes and his judgments to Israel he's not dealt thus with any nation and as for his judgments they have not known them so God has sent his prophets to declare his word to Jacob to Israel it's all about his statutes and his judgment. He gave his law through Moses to them all. And it says he's not dealt thus with any other nation. No other nation was given the law. No other nation was given the law. If you look at the stele of Mar uh, Hammurabi, for example, it shows you, I think, something like 30, 31 laws or something like that. And it all comes from the Ten Commandments. All the other laws that the nations then took on and started to decree certain laws and so on, they all came from the Ten Commandments. They all came from what Moses brought down from the mountain from God. And obviously there were distortions. There's only one true God. There's only, there was only one law. There's only one standard and that's God's standards. We have to understand that. This is God's standards. And as for his judgments, it says they have not known them. So what are his judgments? Have you known his judgments? Have you understood through the law his judgments? Jesus understood the Father's judgments. Jesus actually interpreted the law to us when he said, first is to God and the second is to your neighbour and yourself, to love your neighbour as yourself, to love God and love your neighbour. These are the two commandments he gave us. So these were his judgments that this is what we should keep. We should keep the law through this love. But have you known it that way or are you still legalistic? There are people out there that are in churches all around the land that have been saved by grace and yet they're taken straight back under the law. And today we're going to see 
in the New Testament that this is not right. This is, this is, this is not, not correct. That we're saved by God's grace. We're under a new covenant now and God has given us a new way of seeing his laws, his statutes and his judgments. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me <coughs> with the garments of salvation. God has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Amazing. I never saved myself. It's not me to save myself, it's for God to save me. That's why he wants us to fall on his mercy. <coughs> it says, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. <coughs> as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So it's God who's covered me with this robe of righteousness. I haven't become righteous. I can't be righteous in my own strength. It's an impossibility. It's only through Christ that I become righteous. It's an act of God, act of God's will, act of God's love that's, that's made me righteous. Not by my own righteousness. I am not righteous in my own strength. In fact, if we think we're righteous, we've really got it wrong. The minute you start to think that you're righteous, just be aware that this is self-righteousness. It's not your righteousness. Unless you go back to God's word and understand God's word and know the will of God and know his righteousness, you will never get righteousness in your own strength. You'll never get to a righteous place. How often have we heard about the just war? How often have we heard about <coughs> what everyone thinks should be the right way? We've got it all the time. Political correctness is going on all the time. People are making judgments. People are acting self-righteous. There's always two sides to an argument. We have all the self-righteous political idiots in the world, unfortunately, that are happening all the time, that are, are making all this political correctness and, and public opinion rules and we're going to hell in a handbasket. We need to go back to God's standards. We need to go back to what God's word says about everything. And, and there, is, there is so much wisdom in the word to help us to understand what righteousness really is. And it's no good getting an argument with someone and then start quoting the scriptures to them and being all self-righteous in your scripture quoting to people. There's people out there doing that as well. They're under the guise of Christian and saying, you know, well, God says this, you know. Well, yeah, okay. But you don't know the complete circumstances. Only God knows the heart. So it's best you hold back on that and not be so self-righteous with people. Don't be telling people that they're sinning. Don't be telling people that they're out of order. Allow God's word to work in people's lives, but you don't use the word as something to hit people over the head with in judgment and in your own self-righteousness. Because we can come up with all sorts of scriptures to support our arguments, but we need to go from where God is, is calling us to things, and God is telling us things from in the context of what the scriptures are saying. So this is important. We don't need to be causing problems for people. Hmm? And he's covered me with the robe of righteousness. So in Christ... This is my robe of righteousness because I'm in Christ. I'm putting on the robe of Christ. When I'm in Christ, when God the Father looks at me, he sees Christ because I'm covered by his blood. I'm in the righteousness robe of Christ. Not in my own righteousness. You have to realise that. It's no good trying to be self-righteous. It doesn't work. Just as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So this is, this is how we're supposed to be. We are supposed to adorn ourselves with the ornaments of God. These are the ornaments of beauty. These are the fruits of the Spirit. These are the ornaments that we should be looking at. Not trinkets. Not booty. 
That is treasure, in case you get confused. That word booty means treasure in the dictionary. Okay? <laughs> Just checking it, making sure you realise. <laughs> the other ways they call them booty is it's actually a modern thing. It's the same as, as when we're gay, you know. In my, in my world, gay was happy. Gay now means something completely different. People adulterate words. People change the meaning of words. And we have to be careful. But, you know, when, we, when we're coming to God, He's only interested in those adornments that are fruits of His Spirit. And it's the same with the bride. She adorns herself with her jewels. What are the jewels of a bride? in Christ. We are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Our adornments, our jewels, are the things that we, that we show to God. Faith, hope and charity. These are our jewels. Love is the biggest jewel of the lot. How we, how we are towards other people. What makes someone admirable well, we can think of all the things that we can do to make ourselves look pretty and adorable and admirable to other people in this world, but God's not interested in that. Remember, he takes no pleasure in the strength of a man. He takes no pleasure in all your adornments and all your jewels in this world, all the wonderful things that you put on. He's not interested in that. He's looking at your heart. He wants you to have a pure heart. He wants you to have jewels of honesty and love and purity, and faith. He wants to see you having His righteousness and how you're kind and generous and loving towards others. That's the adornments that He has for you. In fact, it speaks of it further on in the New Testament about a woman should be seen for her inner adornments, not the outward ones. You know? Mercy and kindness and nurturing, these are the things, these are the jewels as far as God is concerned, and this is the same for the church. It says in verse 11, For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So he is going to cause you to spring forth righteousness through his word and through being a believer, through being in Christ, by doing what Christ would have done. You know, what would Jesus do, remember? WWJD used to have those wristbands. You know, what would Jesus do? So he's interested in those kind of adornments. Are we adorned in Christ? Are we seen to be in Christ? This is important. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a lamp that burns. So he's calling the Jewish nation to come forward in righteousness, in his righteousness, in his holiness, not their own. To put God first in their lives. Everything needs to be from God. And that way salvation comes as a lamp that burns. In other words, it continues. Salvation is not just for a moment. Although it is momentary when we get saved, it's not for a moment. Salvation is something that is ongoing. You are being saved. You are saved, but you are being saved. Do you understand? You are being saved every day. Every day God is saving you in some way. Every day God is saving you from yourself. Every day you're being saved from the old man, every day you crucify the old man and follow Christ, you are being saved. It is an ongoing salvation. Amazing. How great God is. Verse 2 says, The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. What is your name? Israel. You're going to be called by a new name. And he talks so much in this about righteousness, about his righteousness, and his righteousness going forth and showing forth and, and being bright as a lamp, an ongoing lamp, not just a quick 
bright light like a you know flashy bulb and suddenly it goes <laughs> that's it it's all over you know you're supposed to be ongoing <laughs> you're supposed to have a, a brightness that can, keeps burning like the lamps the old lamps that the li- the miners took down the the mines with you know my uncles used to be miners in in Scotland and they would take these old lamps down and they needed those to keep going pitch black if you didn't you know you wouldn't be able to see the hand in front of your face and this is the picture of salvation as a light it needs to keep going it's no good people seeing you suddenly you say oh I'm being baptized and you go great that's really interesting what are you doing that for and you get a chance to give your testimony and three months down the line you're not even in church amen where's the salvation where's the bright light (laughs) <laughs> you're not even reading your Bible anymore because I've got the badge. Dunk, I've been stamped, got it on me. What have I got now? Well, not a lot. Where's the brightness? Where's the righteousness of Christ? Where is the being a disciple gone? Oh, well, it's all just, uh, oh, well, I don't know. I've had distractions here and there and things have happened and I've moved on. My goodness. And then we talk about going on holiday and having a holiday from God. Don't go to church when you go on holiday. Oh no, no, I'm having a holiday. Uh, what? Where, where does that come from? Uh, these are the things we have to be aware of. Be careful. Because God is a jealous God. It says, you shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken nor shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. Well, I've gone a bit further than the verses, but that's what happens when God calls us. He makes things right if we're right with him. If we're not right with him, don't expect the blessing. If you're not going to be obedient, if you're just going to get baptized and then go your own way, so be it. So be it. Everyone has the decision to make to either follow God or to be crying. It's entirely up to everyone to decide what they want. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force you into anything. But he is calling you and he's calling you to be the righteousness of God. When we become saints in the kingdom, when we're believers, we become the righteousness of God. That is an awesome responsibility to become the righteousness of God. I look at myself every day and think, well, you know, am I doing well? I don't know. But I know God loves me and I know I want to be righteous and I know I want to do what God calls me to do. And that's all I know. And that's all I can do. But I know that I'm also the righteousness of God. So other people have to look at me and say, is this man a believer or not? Is this man acting out as a disciple of Christ or not. And every one of us have got to do that before God. We are all the time under the microscope being watched for our lives. What are our lives giving as a testimony? What are you doing in your life? Where is the righteousness? Where is the salvation? Where is the service? This is what we have to be our Asking ourselves, really. Anyway, Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. A few short verses. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. So this is where we were. We were kept under guard. Kept under guard by the law. So everybody was watching everybody else under the law. The priests... The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were all, the scribes, they were all watching. The zealots, they were all looking to see whether you were keeping the law. It happens in the church too sometimes. People are always waiting to see a flaw. They're waiting to see you fall over sometimes. And it's wrong. We shouldn't be like that with one another. We should be loving one another. We should be looking to support and help one another and encourage one another in Christ. But the, the law was there as a guard. So if, if you broke the law, you'd be cursed. If you kept the law, you'd be blessed. So that was a guard. 
to guard your heart, to, ca to guard your life so that you would be acceptable to God, that God would be able to bless you. You want to be blessed by God, don't you? You don't want to be cursed by God. And so being blessed by God is really important. And so that law was there to keep you in check, to remind you all the time. That's why they had to write it on their doorposts, put it in their phylacteries. You know, meditate on the word day and night so you knew the law completely, so you didn't break the law. Because breaking the law, even at the smallest point, meant that you had to go and offer sacrifice again to, for, for forgiveness. Without the sacrifice, without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption. So all the time, every time you break the law, you'd have to go and make sacrifice to God. So it was there as a guard, it was there as a, as a tutor. Before the faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. So, it's, you're being kept under the law, you were keeping in it to be blessed, to continue, because there was something coming afterwards. It suggests something's coming here. You're kept for the faith. Trust. You were kept for the trust in God, which would afterward be revealed. Faith in somebody, something, it was going to be revealed afterwards, after being kept under guard by the law, by, by being tutored by the law, by, by being shown this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be law keepers. You're supposed to be obedient to God. And that's what we had here. Verse 24 says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So we have been justified by faith. Amazing. We weren't justified by being good enough. What the law showed us is that we were lawbreakers. The law showed us that we were, we were all sinners. Nobody could keep the law perfectly. So everybody was having to sacrifice all the time. And the high priest had to sacrifice for the whole of Israel once a year. Whew. And hoped that God would accept the sacrifice. So under the law you were sinners. Under the law you're law breakers. Under the law you're cursed until you've offered sacrifice, until the high priest had, had given sacrifice for Israel, they were under, under threat, under condemnation. If they went away from God, all sorts of things could happen. But it was there as a tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Amazing. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So that says something very clear to me. If after, after we've become justified through faith, after we've gained that faith in Christ, we no longer need, we're no longer under a tutor. Whether we need it or not, some people might think you are, but you know we're no longer under that tutor. So if people try to bring you back under the law, whatever church you might be in, if people are teaching that you're saved by grace, but then you have to come back under the law, they've got it wrong. This says so. This explains it very, very simply. After faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, which is was the law. We've already had that expounded, that was the law. We go to chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So Christ, Christ was born under the law. 
<laughs> so he was born in that period and he was able to keep the law perfectly as nobody else ever could because he was also God. And this is why it's so important that we understand he was born under the law because it was before the new covenant of grace he was born under the law and he had to keep the law perfectly otherwise he could not have paid the price for our sin. If he had been a lawbreaker in any point, in any way he would not have been able to pay the sacrifice for your sin. This is so important to our faith. So God sent forth it, virgin birth again you see, God sent forth his son born of a woman. It doesn't say God sent forth his son born of Joseph and Mary. Amen? It says God sent forth his son born of a woman. Just a woman. No man involved. It backs up the virgin birth. Don't let people tell you I can't believe that in science. This is obviously fairy stories and myths. No. This is why God could take our sins upon himself because he, he was born with the nature of God. He was both man and God. He was born of a woman but he was also born of God. So important. And he was born under the law to show that he was the only one who could keep the law. That was an important part. Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So in that day, those people were born under the law of Moses until Christ was crucified and said it's finished. And we had a new covenant through his grace. At this point in time, he's talking to those who were born under the law. Everyone in this, at this time was born under the law. The law had not gone away. It was still there. They were still in, in Zion. They were still part of the Jewish nation and many people were still obeying the law. They were still under the law. Many people still had not been saved. And they were adopted into God's family. They were redeemed. Those that were under the law were suddenly redeemed with this new covenant of grace that, that was ushered in by Jesus Christ. And they became adopted. And, and so that is for us today, that we have been redeemed from that curse of the law. We're no longer under that law. We're no longer under that tutor. We're now under Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And therefore we've been adopted as sons and daughters in his kingdom. Verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of his Son, that's Jesus Christ, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So having the Spirit of Christ in you, your spirit, the spirit of man, your heart, cries out. And the Holy Spirit interprets that crying out to Father, Abba, Father. You are adopted now, the Holy Spirit is in you, and so your spirit is entwined with the Holy Spirit, and your spirit is crying out with God's Spirit, Abba, Father, you have now become an adopted child in God's family. Amazing. Verse 7 says, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. So you're no longer a slave to the law, where you're blessed or cursed. You are now a son or a daughter. You're no longer a worm, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're now a son or a daughter in the kingdom. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Imagine. Christ is like your big brother now. 
at the same time he's your king. He's also your saviour. But he's also like your big brother. And we have the same daddy. Abba, father, daddy. We have the same daddy. We have the same father in heaven. The same father that brought forth his own son, born in Mary's womb, is now, we have now been adopted into that same family and we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are brothers and sisters of Jesus. So in this new kingdom, this new family with our Father in heaven, we are all now brothers and sisters of that same family if we've truly been saved and truly come to God through Christ. It's amazing. Because it says, if, and if you're a son or a daughter now, then an heir of God through Christ, an heir of God. You know what it is to be an heir? You inherit everything. <laughs> God's resources are at your disposal. You inherit everything. When you walk in the Spirit and you are blessed because you're under a new covenant of grace, you inherit everything. You have all the resources at heaven at your fingertips if you can believe in it, if you can trust in it. How big is your Father in heaven? And how strong do you feel your relationship is with him through Christ now you have understood the word of God? and understood this virgin birth, and understood the law, and what it means to us today, and how through Christ that has become a new covenant of grace. And now you have all of this at your disposal. So you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're in the world like in enemy territory. At the same time, we're supposed to love the world, because God loved the world. Everything he made was good. So we're supposed to love the world, but not by comparison to God. We're supposed to hate the world by comparison to our love for God. But in reality, we are supposed to live on this planet as peacemakers, as people of love and principle and purity of heart under this covenant of grace. We are supposed to be full of grace, grace upon grace. Grace has shown us grace. Christ has shown us grace. The Father shown us grace. He showed us grace. So this is what we're, we're about. And then you're an heir of God through Christ. That's it. Let's just go to the Gospel very quickly. John's Gospel. Just to tie this up. So if there's any doubt about who Jesus is and why we need to be in him, this takes everything away. John was his best friend. John knew Christ very well. This was the disciple that, Je that Jesus loved. Interesting. He loved them all, but he specifically loved John. He was his best friend. And John understood who he was. Amazing. Insight. In the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? What's the Word? In the beginning was the Word. That is Jesus Christ. He was the, he's the living Word. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was with God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was God. Can't get much clearer than that. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, Jesus Christ. He was right there in the very beginning. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him, in Jesus Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So then we go into all the rest of it. But Christ was there in the very beginning. So he was, he was already pre-existent. This is what we know about Jesus. He was pre-existent. <laughs> so he is fully God, because he was pre-existent before he manifested in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. That's what it means. So he was right there in the beginning. Christ was there forming the world, creating the world. He's fully God. 
God the Father, God the Son, they are all fully God. They are only subservient in their roles. Father sends the Son, sends the Holy Spirit. But he was pre-existent and he gave up all the majesty of heaven to come at this Christmas time to be a baby in a manger and to serve mankind and to reconcile man to God. That was his mission. So after creating the world, after creating every human possible in this world to procreate and continue what he created and saw this world build and develop, he then came to the world because we were in trouble. He manifested in the flesh. He became like one of us. Incredible. And then John goes and talks about John the Baptist. A man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Verse 8, he was not the light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true life which gives light to every man coming into the world. And so that was John the Baptist's mission was to bring a witness to the fact that Jesus was coming into the world. And it says in verse 10, He, Jesus, was in the world and the world was made through him, Jesus, and the world did not know him. <laughs> so, you know, the Creator came to the earth, manifested in the flesh. He even created Jerusalem. He created everything. And yet, his own didn't know him. The world didn't know him. Verse 11, he came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So, to those of us who did believe in his name, to those who did recognize who he is, to those at that time and to us now, he gives us the right to become the children of God. We are the ones who believe in his name, Jesus Christ, that it is the name above every name. Amen? Amen. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So that says something else. So, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is where the born again aspect comes from. This is where we understand that we have to be born again of the Spirit. So, we're already born of the flesh, but this is, when we believe in his name, we're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, not of a man's will, or a woman's will, nor of the will of any man, but of God. So we're not created spiritual beings. We're not, we're not saved. We're not, we don't become eternal, eternally saved. We don't become adopted into God's family. We don't gain all this in any other way other than through his name. But it implies that we have to be born again of the Spirit. Something suggests something needs to change in us. What shows that we are different? It says in vo verse 14, And the Word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, the only Son of the Father. We behold His glory, full of grace and truth. So that is the Master that we serve. He's full of grace and truth. That's the important thing to remember. He's full of grace and truth. So important. Talks about John the Baptist again. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So even though John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus, John is saying, But he was before me. Hello? He was before me. John the Baptist knew he was before him. He knew that he had manifest in the flesh. He knew that he was God. Amazing. Verse 16, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. So Paul is saying that we've all received grace for grace. 
You've received grace for grace. What does that mean? You have received grace, in other words, you have received the love of God to then be grace, to have grace with others. So important you understand that. You will see, receive grace for grace. You have to become a channel of God's grace. You have to be a channel of the Holy Spirit outworking in your life. This is important. says verse 17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So any church that's telling you you're saved by grace and then putting you back under the law has lost it. Unfortunately, evangelicals do this all the time. They, they talk grace, but they put you back under the law. And that's no good. We are not part of the holiness ministry. We are people of a new covenant of grace. And it's important that we understand this. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He's the one who interpreted the law through love. Grace. Verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So nobody has seen God. But Jesus has declared him. Jesus has shown him. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, do you not know me by now? Do you not know who I am by now? Do you not understand who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the representation of the Father on earth. I am the Father manifesting in the flesh for you. And if you believe in the name that God sent his only son Jesus Christ, if you believe in that name that God sent him and he really is both God and man, that that is how you get saved by by recognizing the father through the son and becoming part of his kingdom, you're recognizing the father. You're not just recognize. It's not just Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. You know, look at him. Oh, he, he got crucified. Poor Jesus. You know, and that's it. When we when we understand Jesus with his words and what he what he showed us, what he taught us, how he loved us, he was showing us the Father. You have to see the Father in Christ. So when I've said to you before, you know, look for the Father. When you, when you look at other people, look for, look for Jesus in other people. When you look in the mirror, look at Jesus. Look for Jesus in the mirror. When you look in the Eucharist, look for signs of Jesus. But when you find Jesus, you then need to look for, Je for the Father in Jesus. For the Father heart. St. Francis of Assisi was reportedly... He went up to a leper and kissed him. A leper. He embraced him and kissed him. When he was up, why did he do that? He said, I saw Jesus. And that's great. But we must see the Father because it's the Father who sent the Son. Do you understand? And they're both fully God. So we need to see the Father We're believing in the name of Jesus from the Father. And how the Father loves you and has welcomed you into his, his family as adopted children. This is so important. Amen? Amen. God bless you. <laughs>